prison and the state actually act as extended arms of the domains of family and community in dealing with women and their crimes. Now, there are two paradoxical processes that are going on. One is the process of memorialization. So the outstanding example is Fulan Devi. Or the other is that of invisibilization. So you don't want to think of them as criminals. Uh, they're mere accomplices or um, you know, they have been forced into it and, and things like that. The way in which the family tries to uphold its own honor, um, you see that the strategy is to invisibilize the deviant, right? Um, and when this happens, then what happens is that you keep the men at the forefront and the women as uh, mere accomplices. Now, as a result of this, they're further invisibilized in the criminal justice system. What this would mean in reality is that, you know, women will have very little information about the case, about the progress of the cases. They will be less likely to get bail uh, than their male counterparts in the same cases and so on. For many women, when you think of their lives, there is a kind of continuity between these very different kinds of institutions, institutions which are free and open and so on, and uh, the prison and other custodial institutions, for instance. So women then tend to therefore bear a double burden of uh, criminal acts. One is in the eyes of the law, you're a criminal, but you've also disrupted uh, social norms, right? I mean, a simple example like, you know, the female ward in a prison is considered to be a prison within a prison. You know, the way in which it is laid out, the way in which the practices around it are ordered, and the kind of constraint that is placed on women prisoners, the kind of control, the kind of disciplining, all of that suggests that um, they're subservient to the rest of the prison. So this invisibilization actually requires the entire system to be complicit.